thanks a lot for uh, being here, guys, and also folks from the panel. Uh, <laughs> I'm Adil Patel from Mudrex. Uh, Mudrex is a crypto investing platform. We help users invest in crypto in an easy, simplest way. Um, I think one of our core products is a product called as Coinsights, where we offer these crypto baskets akin to index funds for crypto that helps users get started very easily. Um, and yeah, of course, you've got all the standard stuff like we are a compliant entity with the FIU, we have uh, a QPI based flow for on ramp, off ramp, and uh, so on and so forth. That's about me. Thanks. Hi, my name is Avinash. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant, and uh, I run a crypto exchange uh, called pi42.com. It's uh, uh, basically uh, INR denominated perpetual futures where you can. Uh, buy or sell long or short uh, crypto using INR. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. So my name is uh, Satwe Kishanath, the CEO and co-founder at UnoCoin. Uh, so we started UnoCoin in 2013. So this is 11th year of our business. So ours is the first exchange or the trading platform to provide uh, access to Bitcoin to Indians. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rahul Bhadoria. I am founder and CEO of ESP Softec, which is a blockchain development company and co-founder of Mr. Mint, uh, which is a Web3 based product. Uh, we are building a strong ecosystem uh, in Web3 and implementing Web3 in diversified industry. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. This is Anuj. I am vice president uh, engineering and blockchain at Zepay, which is one of the leading crypto exchanges in India. Uh, I also work with various uh, Web3 startups and educational institutes uh, for broader use cases and uh, education around blockchain. Thank you. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Saurav Raj, founder of uh, Tokenize. And what we do is asset tokenization across multiple non-fungible asset classes, starting with real estates, carbon credits. And the whole idea is to bring trust, traceability, and power to each and every individual to trade in so-called non-tradable assets. Thank you. Sorry, everyone, for a little short delay. Uh, without any further ado, we quickly get into the panel. So first thing, anybody who's a crypto enthusiast or a Bitcoin enthusiast, congratulations. They just crossed 70,000 USD, so that's amazing. It's amazing for the uh, you know, crypto ecosystem. And basically, I hope today's panel and our you know, esteemed panelists are able to shed the light on the entire ecosystem and why should more amateur you know, potential investors should take into it more seriously. Right? So, you know, without any further ado, my first question will be to you, Anvinash, sir. Right. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, with the union budget, uh, interim union budget which came, it was a little disappointing for the ecosystem that there was no revisions for the TDS. So how is the ecosystem, you know, is it still hopeful about it or they feel that, you know, something is going to come nearby? So, uh Obviously, I mean, we have when this 1% TDS and uh, like punitive taxation, as you call it, came on, uh, was levied on crypto, everyone was really disappointed. And, uh, and we are, as an industry, uh, we are discussing with the government at various level, uh, trying to explain them that why uh, these taxations are, in fact, counterproductive to what the government is trying to achieve, what the industry is trying to achieve and why this is leading to innovation going out of India. Uh, the next, so crypto, especially Bitcoin, I think uh, next five to 10 years, hundreds of billion dollars or even trillion dollars company will be created in this industry. And uh, by not welcoming or like putting this kind of taxation, in a way government is a, uh, pushing those people, innovators out of India. Uh, so those companies will be created out of India by Indians, uh, which is uh, obviously not good for us as an economy. Uh, so my view is that I think ultimately uh, it's a matter of time. I mean, we, we all are uh, uh, trying a lot. Satvik is taking a lead there. Uh, it's, it will happen. Uh, when it will happen, whether it's this budget or next budget, uh, my guess is that maybe the government is, government is looking at a comprehensive regulations and then along with that they will reduce the taxation. Uh, but I think sooner the better because I said that Bitcoin is already re 70 k uh, and there is lots of momentum globally. Uh, and 
I believe that somewhere Indians may be losing out of uh, this. Great, sir. Thank you. And my next question will be to you, Edul, and uh, Dr. Satwik, is that this entire 1% uh, TDS on, you know, VDAs has pushed a lot of investors overseas, you know, they've made the transition towards, you know, offshore platforms and all. So what are, you know, like you guys particularly and the ecosystem doing to, you know, get that pool back? See, uh, TDS is one reason why a lot of traders go outside. But in reality, a lot of users also go outside just because the quality of service and product is better. The real way to get users back is to give them a high quality product and a high quality service experience and that's what you do. And that's exactly what we've been seeing also over the last few years, right? Ki as the products in the country are improving and becoming better and better and better, more and more and more users are choosing to come over here. The second thing that's happening is that because of the FIU compliances and so on and so forth, uh, it is just better for the users to work with India regulated or entities that are registered with uh, the government in India simply because there is a clear direct legal recourse if something goes wrong, right? Uh, now, of course, you can't, uh, and then there are other things that the government is also doing, for example, limiting access to certain websites and so on and so forth, which will also drive users back to the ecosystem. But in reality, the only thing that you can do is to make sure that the product service experience is great. And as that continues to improve, users will eventually come back. Dr. Satwik? Yeah. So uh, when the 1% TDS got introduced, um, if you see, that was actually you know very much in the bull market time. And obviously, government would have gone through their records of uh, how much profit uh, a trader would be making and such, So which at that time would have looked like, yeah, they're making money. Right. So, but however, that uh, is not favorable enough when it comes to the uh, normal or bear markets. So, so that, that is one thing. So we want government to not just see at once w w one short span of time, but maybe we have the history of uh, about 10 years of uh, trading crypto in India. So if you consider all of that, uh, maybe it, it could get better. But on the other side, uh, the reason for why 1% tax was uh, so that they can uh, keep count or they can keep the account of uh, uh, how much trading uh, is happening within India. But for that, it need not be 1%. It can be uh, quite lesser as well. If you see that 1%, usually in normal transaction, we for some land and such. So where if it is more than 50 lakhs, there is a 1% uh, TDS that, it, that they are charging. But on the other side, uh, the number of times a particular land would get transacted a year on the other side you know we have number of times a crypto could get transacted in a year so there is no comparison to it probably crypto might have even changed hands 20 times but land probably will change hands once in 20 years so with with that kind of scenario i think um, it's quite high uh, keeping it is still good right so it, it actually uh, keeps everything accountable for and in control uh, but it, it probably will take uh, maybe a year or more uh, for them to um, eventually realize that 1% TDS is not just about 1%, it's also hurting the industry, right? So uh, then now we are not able to get a really good, um, say, liquidity you know, on one side. Then the uh, last rate price, whatever we see, uh, it sometimes doesn't match uh, to the international standards. So th that is on the other side. And, and also people are ending up taking bad uh, bad exit and entry decisions because they are trying to see how they can outsmart the 1% TDS. So trying to do that, it's actually tough, I would say. Um, anyway, it's, it's a good industry and people make money, so we have to just neglect it and do, but for people who are doing maybe few trades a week, 1% really matters because over a period of one year, half of their money will get struck. So uh, whatever is happening definitely need to change. Yeah. Great. So my next question will be to you, uh, Rahul and Saurav. Um, so, uh, you know, like Edun said that that 1% TDS, it's fine. But the crux is that you get, like, you know, the crypto platforms need to improve their offerings, the services and everything, right? So currently, where do you rate the entire crypto, you know, um, exchange and user ecosystem right now in India? Right. You, you want to take that first? Sure. So uh, the, the whole idea of crypto exchanges, I mean, if you, if you look at it at the very base layer, it's a, it's a platform which allows exchange of some commodity, some asset which has a value, right? Now, the, the message here which, which I want you know, to, to share with all of you is, 
crypto is just one such asset category which comes out of the blockchain you know world or the ecosystem right um, and, and that's that's just very popular because it's easy to transact and you can do a bunch of stuff but i don't want us to lose a bigger part of the vision here which is when you start to think of the various other asset categories right which are very very difficult to, to trade and transact and, and and work on it for example real estate it is one of the oldest and the most golden asset categories in the entire world in the entire human history and that is fraught with so many scams and challenges i mean everyone has a story around somewhere they got scammed out of a real estate deal right now that's an asset category right now when you look at regulations here is where i would look at it typically regulations or a tax on any transaction creates an additional proof that something happened while and this is this is something which predates technology right the entire banking system the financial infrastructure how it created because two parties who would not trust one another would go to a bank as a third party to ensure that they record a transaction which happened now technology does it it will take some time for us to uh, adapt and adopt to it but the taxation of such a transaction validates that yes something happened so tomorrow in the absence of such and such technology you can always right. rely on the local government official or the gst database for example or any other database to actually give you that proof reliably right now when you come to exchanges regulation will help them because then it will lay out and prescribe those guidelines right on how and what information should be included so when you want to verify if i am trying to sell you for example this you know hotel is tokenized and i sell, tell you hey you know i have uh, you know 500 square feet of this prime real estate project Uh, I want to, you know, plan a, a Europe trip in 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 the end of March, and I want to give you 250. How would you ever know if I have those 500 units in my name? Versus in the absence of a blockchain-based distributed ledger record, if I could show you a taxed, you know, transaction on that, you will know that yes, there was government behind it. Which means, eventually, if there is a fraud or a scam or something, you have some recourse to action. Now, the reason of all of this is all of us in this room. we are privileged we have access to smartphones and computers but i believe the government comes up with these guidelines regulations and you know control the market not for all of us they know we are smart enough we can figure it out they are doing it for the rest of the 90 99% of the population which exists outside of this room right and that is where some part of it is related to that some part of it is also to give structure to how things would work and that is why i'm very positive that what they have done for example sebi has come with the msm reit right that tells us that this is a prescribed way in which we can do things which means if we build as a community as as the you know the, the web3 community we build something now which aligns with that your end user your investors your your customers would be confident right that i can go ahead and do this now that's retail now when you move to enterprise right and when you regulate things the enterprises they will have some reliability that if they are going to build an infrastructure a solution a product even if they are putting traceability or supply chain carbon credits right you have seen carbon credits of the amazon rain for they've they've gone into scams right if those come through these mechanisms right then the end user has reliable proof that something has happened something is existed and if i'm putting money behind that i'm not letting my money go down the drain or washing it down the river stream right and that is what is absolutely critical and that's what we have to understand so these i believe should go hand in hand and although over regulation is never good but some part of it helps us innovate and build things faster right today when i go and talk to people i tell them yes there is a regulation it is guidelines today it will come you can be confident that you will get something tangible please out please begin and i think that is how this thing helps mm-hmm. right Hello. Like, uh, as we know, like uh, crypto and Web3 has a very significant growth in uh, uh, in Web3 industry. And uh, if we talk about the global market, uh, there has been uh, significant growth in the crypto adopting of the users. Where, uh, if we talk about in numbers, 420 million of users are adopting crypto. and reason behind that uh, there are big companies and big brands who are accepting crypto as a payment uh, method for payment and uh, this positive sentiments um, gives the energy of the users who are adopting and crypto exchanges hmm? uh, are abhi time lag raha hai number of users 15 minute um uh, people at the console can you please check yeah please continue sure so based on this positive sentiments uh, the crypto exchanges like binance and coinbase they are uh, increasing number of uh, users a very significant growth over there i believe if indian government like uh, 
make some uh, competitive regulate, uh, regulation law and taxes, then definitely Indian exchange or the crypto community can also like uh, uh, significant growth. I believe Indian Indian uh, community are very interested in crypto. Uh, and if Indian government uh, makes some competitive regulant, then India can be become uh, world's n largest number of uh, crypto community over the world. Okay. Uh, to, to add to that quickly, I mean, if you know, uh, there is something called IFSCA, which is being set up out of Gujarat, and which kind of takes the lead in allowing these alternative asset classes, if you feel, and bring them on to the mainstream. The other thing which it does is very well is uh, enable investment from outside of India, which you know is very, very difficult for across any asset class in India. And that is a good route, and when it becomes regulated, what it helps is not only investors in India, but people from outside to bring that capital inside. And you know, for an economy to grow, some amount of capital has to come. Not excessive, but some. And the final piece is when you talk about infrastructure, you also have to see that cost of transactions, which is where enterprise adoption, which will you know, create the next wave of you know, Web3, is the transactions have to be you know, deterministic. Right? Deterministic in the sense of the cost of transaction. You cannot have something which is very inflationary, which you cannot have something which is very deflationary. And that is why some, some of the newer you know, blockchains which have come, the newer exchanges, for example, Algonan is a good example where a cost of a transaction is fixed. You do 10,000, you do 5,000, you do one. You know, you can determine what the cost of you know, that infrastructure is, and that is what you can build these exchanges on. And I believe we will see some of those coming up, and, and I believe there is a great future of, of you know, Web3 that we are, we are yet to see. Yeah. And sir, your thoughts on that? Yeah, <coughs> so basically you covered multiple points. I'll just try to touch each one of them. So one, uh, you know, for the TDS and taxation part, you know, what we are doing, and you know, it's been done by all crypto exchanges. Uh, we are all part of, uh, you know, Bharat Web3 Association, and we are pushing for the reforms on crypto taxation, uh, make it competitive to the global environment. Uh, so that is something which is in progress, and there are multiple fruitful discussions that have happened with the government. And because this was the interim budget, hopefully, you know, we'll have a full-fledged budget after the elections. Uh, we all hope to see the, uh, the reduction in the crypto taxes. Uh, the second thing which is happening, uh, you talked about the features of Indian exchanges versus you know, the offshore exchanges. Uh, Indian e uh, crypto ecosystem is comparatively new to you know, what Coinbase is and you know, the, the balances of the world have been doing from past several years. However, we are catching up very, very fast. You know, if you see uh, the features of crypto exchanges in India, uh, you know, we, we are integrating, like for example, I can talk about Zepay, we are integrating futures, we are, uh, uh, we are introducing limits to the quick trade. Uh, you know, we are trying to implement some AI-based features which are completely unique, uh, even to the offshore exchanges. So a so lot of innovation is going into the, into the exchange and crypto world where people are trying to build new and new features, and especially those features which can appeal to the Indian audience. So there is a Desi version of you know crypto things which are coming, and one of the most important thing that Zepay is doing is that it is trying to educate the community about cryptos and why it should be used uh, as a medium of uh, you know earning good incentives. So so we try to publish blogs, we try to publish educational videos, we try to sensitize the people that you know what are the FEMA laws, you know what and what if they go outside of India. Uh, to do these transactions, what can this lead to? Because you know these kind of things can have legal implications, right? So, so as a responsible exchange, what we are trying to do is we are trying to educate people. We are trying to bring people back to the Indian exchanges. Okay, your taxes will be deducted, but at least you are compliant. You know you are living in a uh, in a in a legal system, and you don't need to worry about the government and the the taxation. Great, thank you, sir. You just, you know, touched upon this one word, compliance. Before we get to that, we have, uh, you know, Jyotsna from uh, um, BitGet. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jyotsna. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us for this panel discussion on tokenized worlds. Uh, you know, considering the fact that you're heading uh, South Asia, uh, you know, division of BitGet, I want to understand what are the different trends you see, you know, in comparison to the South Asia. Asia holistically and in India. Are there any changes, differences, trends, you know? Could you shed light on that? Yeah, I, I think these days the sentiment I would say is very positive. 
it comes to the overall crypt trend and the scale of the bull run that is expected um, in India and the countries. I do think there are certain fundamental differences in Indian users' behavior versus Asian users' behavior overall. So to add there, for example, Indian users are very risk averse. So they would actually want to hold on to Bitcoin in spots and eventually hold on to them for stable returns in the long run. Versus Asian users, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the main difference I feel is because the history of, you can say, gaming and regulated industries in terms of gaming, gambling, etc. that you can say, the risk appetite for Asian users, whether you consider East Asians like Japanese or Koreans or Southeast Asians like Philippines, Vietnam, those users are much more risk averse. And they transact into very sophisticated financial products in terms of derivatives products, high leverages. Indian users, on the other hand, still have the financial market mindset where they capital asset. So the fundamental difference we do between holding works is a trading behavior between Indian users versus Asian users. But overall, it's overall quite uh, positive and optimistic in the next 6 to 18 months horizon for sure. Great. Thank you so much, Jyotsna. Uh, so coming back on the whole compliance thing, uh, obviously we know that, you know, recently Google and Apple, they delisted a number of, you know, uh, crypto exchanges from the app. And one of the untouched one was obviously Edul, your Mudrex, right? So I just want to know what is your advice to fellow, you know, crypto budding crypto exchange startups and how can they be in the safe radar in the, you know, the safe zone when it comes to, you know, government regulation compliances? No, so I think the only platforms that were removed by Google and Apple were the ones that Methi explicitly asked to. And all of those were uh, entities that had not registered with the FIU. Uh, the, the FIU has basically just said, Ki, come, tell us the transactions and the transactions that are, that are happening. Inform us about users who are doing suspicious transactions or violating uh, KYC AML guidelines. And everything else is kosher. No one is saying not to do business. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Just stay compliant, follow the rule of law, and uh, everything else should be fine. Great. So, uh, Anusar, could you just add to that thing? Yeah, same thing. I think what uh, Edul mentioned is the first thing is, you know, whenever you are starting your crypto journey, either as an exchange or any other innovative idea, just try to learn and understand the regulations around it and what the government stand is and try to be compliant with it. Okay. There are regulatory bodies, there are forums where you can register, where you can acquire the knowledge that is needed. Innovation is one part of it and legality is another part of it. So while you innovate, build wonderful products, please remain compliant and uh, there are 0% chances that you will be banned. Yeah, just to add, like this is very normal. Every industry has some compliance that you need to follow, right? You can't become a broker without registering with the SEBI. Uh, so it's the same thing that is being asked here. No, no, it's I not, do, uh, I do it's understand. It's just that this crypto is a very budding space, right? Mm -hmm. It's not mature enough in that level, you know, Jahape, that you can the registration with the SEBI wala thing can happen. So I just want to know, since it's a very budding one, and obviously it has a lot of uh, road, not exactly roadblocks, but you know, a little, you know, hesitations, you know, here and there and all. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, get your opinion on that thing, you know, because obviously being compliant is great. Everybody should be compliant, but that just does not happen, right? There are some, you know, like this, it just happens, you know, they are not all the safe players in a particular ecosystem. No, so uh, think of it this way, that uh, a level of compliance in any given industry is put in because there are certain safeguards that are necessary for the investor base to operate. For example, you can't tomorrow start a drug manufacturing company because if you create drugs and sell those drugs and those drugs are not if whatever approved, then there are lives at stake, right? So there is levels of compliance for everything. The same is true for something like crypto where now there is an FIU registration you register and then you can do X, Y, Z activities. The, this similar kind of registration exists outside of India as well. For example, Mudrex also offers their services to a lot of European users. And we are a registered virtual asset service provider in the EU as well, where the, uh, the, the compliance requirement is actually at par with what we have in India. So it's not something out of the blue. Uh, coming back to crypto, 
there are some very specific things that the FIU has outlined and said that in only in these, these, these cases do you need to come and register with us. In a lot of other cases, uh, it actually does not require an explicit registration. For example, if let's say you are building a Web3 gaming company, you are creating a game on Web3. That doesn't require you to go out and register. If and, and if you want the transactional flow, you can partner with a company that is FIU registered to be able to do everything that you want to. So the, the requirement is actually not that high. The bar is not that large. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward thing. I would argue that uh, getting your company registered with the ROC is a more tougher thing to do than uh, uh, registering with the FIU. Okay. Okay, and since you just mentioned that obviously Mudra X is also, you know, offering its services in EU, and you just said, you know, like, roughly it's the same, the regulation, the, you know, everything from the government aspect is uh, same, but is there anything you would wish or want the Indian government to you just take note of something, you know, the regulatory path which is taking place in other countries? Uh, sir, for you as well, Avinash, mean, sir, for you both. Yeah, so I... I uh, if you just uh, rewind slightly back and see what's happened over the last four years, we first had the overturn of the of the RBI by the Supreme Court judgment. Then there was tax. Now there is the registration of the FIU. All of this shows that there is a pathway that is being being built towards creating a setup where crypto companies can op operate very very seamlessly. Today we are slightly away from there. Uh, like, for example, there are still difficulties that crypto companies face with, for example, partnering with banks or payment providers. There are still difficulties you face with, let's say, filing taxes, filing TDS, and so on and so forth, right, which we've already talked about. As time progresses, this will just improve and get better is what my guess is. Uh, I'm actually seeing it move faster than what I had originally expected, so that's anyways a good thing. Uh, and I think we are progressing fast towards that. What also needs to be understood that all of this does take time. Like, at the, at the one side, you can say, Kiare, industry de re, ye karne de re, woni karne de re. on the other hand, the job of the regulator is also really tough, right? Their job is to make sure that the, the average end consumer is protected and safeguarded. That's their first priority. Everything else comes later. And here we are talking about crypto, which is not an asset, not a commodity, not a property, yet somehow, some ways, all of those together as well. So it's complex in itself. So oh, it's hard to come up with clear regulations everywhere. I guess what will start happening is that there will be carve-outs created one by one by one for specific industries. The largest industry as such that's actively doing anything in crypto are exchanges at this point in time. That's why there is a carve-out for that. As time progresses, more and more and more niche, -er, niche, -er, niche -er things will come up. There will be carve-outs created for that. And that's how it happens. It's, uh, it's just due for time. Avinas, sir? So I'll tell you do two, three, like, positives, good points and bad points, basically your points which I think we need need to work uh, as a society. One is I think, uh, I said that some progress has been made uh, uh, from the time where there was a draft law which says that people will be put in jail and like 50 lakh rupees, 2 crore rupees of fine uh, to RBI uh, uh, notification getting reversed to taxation coming in which gave which gave some legitimacy, although the tax is very high. And now this FIU registration. Uh, so as far as FIU registration, what we need to understand is that the suspicious transaction reporting is like a, one of the current cornerstone of any financial industry anywhere in the world. Whether you are bank, you are, whether you are financial institutions, where you are, whether you are in the stock market, uh, which basically means is that if the, f as if, as a service provider, which deals in financial services, which crypto is in a way, uh, you find certain transactions which are suspicious, which are, let's say, related to money laundering or related to terrorism financing or related to uh, some kind of use. Uh, then it is your job to analyze those transactions and report to a central authority saying that we found this. Uh, so in a way, you are helping fight, fight crime, okay? And uh, so, in a way, it's a very, very positive uh, development uh, that the government has recognized that crypto players are responsible enough uh, to be able to do this job, which is a very, very important and very, very sensitive job. Uh, having said that, I think, uh, I believe that the progress has been slow in terms of fully regulating crypto. Uh, and two parts to it. One is that, uh, 
what we need to understand is that, and this is applicable anywhere in the world, that if something is not illegal, it is legal. Okay, that's a very, very fundamental interpretation of the law. But sometimes what we have seen is that this fundamental principle is not followed, especially at the local, local level, when you go to at the local level, uh, there's still people think that crypto is illegal, which it was never, it is not illegal, it was never illegal. But when you go to the, I mean, to the local level, to the police level, to the uh, local cyber crime level, uh, that is not regulated, uh, which creates lots of hindrance in terms of adoption of the technology. Second is that crypto exchange is still, I mean, we are in a way taking a risk, operating here, building an exchange. But imagine a guy who's an engineer who wants to innovate in a Web3 space. He doesn't have a legal background, he doesn't have a uh, uh, accounting or law background. Now, if I am that guy, will I innovate here in India where I don't know whether tomorrow the government will come up with something which will make it illegal? Or will I go outside India where the environment is much more clearer, uh, where I know that I need to only focus on the job which I'm doing, which is innovating, and I don't need to worry about that someone somewhere after five years will come to me and say that whatever you did was wrong. So I think to that extent, we are very, very slow in a way. Uh, this industry is moving very fast. And if as a society, if we don't want to be left behind, then we have to be really, really quick on this rather than uh, taking so much time. Okay, thank you, sir. And you just mentioned, you know, the awareness aspect of it, right? That, you know, people at the, you know, like the minuscule level, they might not be aware that it's legal or illegal, right? So uh, my question would be to you, Dr. Satwik, is that uh, how is your company, a startup, trying to make a change in that aspect, even in the most smallest, minutest way? So, so, so when we started our company in 2013, say until up to 2016, uh, if you are saying anyone that what is Bitcoin, because that is the first fundamental question in those years, after half of the explanation, they lose interest, right? So, and you say that, okay, it is RB regulated, is, is it semi regulated, how are you doing? So it's the number of questions from people, you actually will not have the answers for them yet, right? Uh, so, but I think in 2017, media did a good job of uh, uh, telling about Bitcoin to people, because that is one of the good year where the prices of a lot of cryptos went up, right? So since then, I think it has got a little better, but again in 2020, when RBA came up with a stance that banks should not support the crypto exchanges. Again, a lot of people think, that, okay, if banks should not be doing it, why they should not be doing it, which means maybe it's illegal, right? So it, it is kind of the inference they are trying to draw is depending upon the limited information that people have. So the only way you can combat that is keep on informing whatever you want to inform again and again, that how you should consider it, the perspectives you should have towards it, et cetera, and try to take, take you know, your, your customers, your country forward with it. So till, um, till the date where we very, very clearly, uh, the, uh, when Oakley government says that it is legal, uh, maybe P or not everyone will believe that. On the other side, when the 30% taxation came up, they compared it with uh, gambling and betting. Okay, so they were comparing with gambling and betting to take that kind of tax, they are not comparing the, they are not telling the industry itself is gambling and betting. So this kind of confusions actually have created a lot of havoc, I think. Um, and th I know only about India to, to such an extent where, you know, such kind of issues exist. In other places, um, generally, at least the developing and developed countries, the, the rules have been more clearer. Uh, the governments have been more local, okay, this you should not do. Okay, if there is some fake exchange starting, the government will actively go there and shut down, etc. But here, my new question nowadays is, when government is specifically asking for more taxes, and if they are asking for higher TDS, then what is that we are getting back in return, right? So, is there a better recourse where, okay, if someone gets scammed in crypto, they can do anything about it? Not really. Right, and and when you say when if, if we uh, need say crypto advertisements or uh, say sharing of knowledge, anything like that, government is trying to do not really right. But when it comes to a lot of other industries where such kind of taxes do get assessed, uh, then there is some something given back. Like for the income tax I pay, and 
uh, for the GST I pay, know that, okay, there is some infrastructure, uh, you know, cost goes for it. The security that government provides for everyone uh, in terms of enforcement and such things to keep the entire uh, country at peace, it goes for it. But this for this one, I actually am yet to strongly see how they are giving it back yet. Rahul, could you just add to that? What do you think of it? Yeah, so uh, I will agree on it uh, because, you know, like uh, uh, when we comes to come out, come out the crypto taxes, so uh, similarly people uh, compare with the gambling taxes and, uh, where uh, it's, it's very high, uh, it's very hard to educate the people or to understand like crypto taxes are a different thing in the gaming and uh, and as we know, like uh, crypto taxation uh, has been like become a very challenges when everyone wants to any uh, startup in Web3. So I believe ki, uh, there should be some uh, significant or some uh, competitive uh, tax taxation, uh, taxation rules. So startups and a Web3 uh, entrepreneur can uh, focus on their startups or their innovations instead of uh, finding the challenges in taxes. Okay, great. And this will be my last question to all of you. What is your prediction for the space in for 2024 and five years down the line? So we'll start with you. Right. So, so that's a that's a good and you know wonderful comments from all the panelists. Uh, looking forward, I think I can say three things of what we should expect and what we can look forward to. The first would be that there's a lot of innovation which already has happened, and you know the exchanges, the ZPs, the Mudras of the world have done that we should be able to learn from that. And that brings me to the second point is, we, we've seen India as the hotbed of financial I innovation, right? I mean, the UPIs and, and everything that has happened, we are way ahead of the, the world in, in that sense. And I believe the biggest of the crypto innovations or Web3 innovations will come from India as well, right? Now, when you put these two together and take it on to different asset classes, commodities exchange, power trading, right? That does very, it, it's already allowed by the way today, and when you bring the capability of Web3 to those kind of categories, domains, industry verticals, be it asset trading, be it uh, you know, uh, trading of uh, startups which are not uh, listed on the stock exchange, right? I mean, unlisted companies, right? You create a, a, an enormous, you know, a big universe of innovation and opportunities for every individual. And that is the second thing. And the third thing which we will see, which will come again, a bit from the compliance side and a bit for saving the plant as well, is ESG, right? Now, blockchains have been known for consuming a lot of power energy, and it always comes up in some discussion or the other. But there are ways to do that, and that, again, will be something which this technology will support, and I think, uh, you know, that will become more and more popular as, you know, the governments around the world, and in fact, in India as well, will come down and say, yes, it's good that you're running blockchain, or even, let's say, AI LLMs, which consume a lot of energy and, you know, bandwidth in the background. What are they doing to, you know, you know offset all of that, that work, right? So I think in summary, it's just along, along these three lines. One is innovation, extension to other asset categories and classes, and the third is looking at the ESG of it. And I think there's a future for everyone in India who is innovating and building this space is bright, and, and you know, coming to these forums actually helps you know, bring not only the tech side of it, but the legal, the compliance, and, and everything else put together, right? Thank you. Thank you. Edu, you? Yeah, I think uh, by this year, I expect uh, crypto to be front and center in everyone's uh, conversations again. Uh, it already seems like we are sitting in March, February 2020, and it, as, thing, as things progress, uh, we should continue to be in that pathway. Uh, but over the next four or five years, I, I believe that there is a very large opportunity to build uh, large crypto Web3 businesses out of India, because crypto gives us this, it's, it's a truly, truly globalized asset, right? So it's available to everyone, and at the same time, problems of all users world over are the same. So over the next four or five years, we'll see multiple global companies being built out of India that are solving problems for users in this space, which will not necessarily only be exchanges or trading platforms, but actual use cases of crypto. Avin Asa? So actually, uh, my comment is that, uh, I mean, all of us can see that crypto is or blockchain technology is something which is already changing the world and it will i think next 5 to 10 years uh, it will be bigger than internet uh, at its peak okay now the question which is that will india be forefront in that or not uh, will indians will go will indians go out and innovate or Indians will just become CEO of a global trillion dollar companies. 
so that is a choice i think uh, which we need to make and uh, we may need to make it like pretty quickly uh, that is one second is i think in terms of price uh, i mean everyone is talking about that okay now it become hot so in my view certain level price matters because it uh, it brings attention to the ecosystem but i think at certain level price doesn't matter i mean for me there is no good price for bitcoin basically so uh, but yeah i mean if the price goes up it attracts more investment it attracts more talent to the industry to the that extent obviously it matters uh, but as an investment as a as a my commitment to the ecosystem the price doesn't matter and i think most of the people who are sitting on this panel it doesn't matter dr satvik would you agree with that yeah i definitely agree <laughs> so so for us i mean when we started the company the cheapest bitcoin we have sold is for 11000 rupees so which was in 2014 um, i guess so after seeing so much of ups and downs um, and difficult uh, difficulties etc it's uh, it matters less but price actually what it does is it's, it gives you a confidence that whatever you are trying to do it's actually like working fine and uh, it's actually working fine and you know the world is looking forward for something better the kind of thing uh, but on the other side yes we do talk about technology but a lot of times uh, uh, you know not many people get into that thing right so they, they just want to see how i can make money out of it and what i can invest now and what i can exit but anyway so we want those as our customers so no complaints um, but if i am talking about the predictions for this year um, i think most of the news and whatever we see around will still be uh, around price itself um, at, at least this year it, it looks like that because it has started we were expecting the bullish year to be the next year but it looks like it has uh, started little little sooner but if i see about 5 years down the line um, i definitely see some kind of uh, amendments to our present taxation system which would have definitely given uh, which would have definitely you know paved way for uh, uh, new entrepreneurs and investors within india and this this industry is definitely something that we as indians don't want to lose right so uh, if if the kids who are just out of the college are showing so much of interest today they are not showing interest in lot of other industries the established industries that have existed since for centuries right so the, the their first idea is what i can do what i can tokenize what i can uh, automate and what i can build on present technologies that is like really disrupting right now and this usually will be their first choice so given this and as they become entrepreneurs in the future maybe 5 years 10 years uh, definitely the uh, we as the country uh, and our policy should not become a hindrance hindrance for it is is what i believe so once that happens i think things should come back we might have also seen another bull run within another 5 years i guess yeah rahul you yeah i believe uh, future is bright um, if you talk about the upcoming this year 2024 uh, after approving of bitcoin etf uh, the investors and the big brand are having trust more trust on the cryptocurrencies and investing more and more so that's why the bitcoin has recently uh, crossed all time high and of course yes the in uh, by the end of the year uh, bitcoin and cryptocurrencies will be uh, more higher uh, what we have uh, in terms of long term uh, growth i believe in technology so uh, because cryptocurrency is the first use case of the blockchain technology but there are lot of industries or lot of areas where uh, technology can be invented uh, so i believe uh, in upcoming years all the industries will be implemented by web3 and of course yes if we any solutions who are working in web3 will uh, accept the payment form in crypto only so there will be high volumes of cryptocurrency uses and uh, as we know like uh, internet web point 2.0 took 20 to 25 years to adopt and uses for all the uh, community in the um, uh, lower audience so of course yes uh, cryptocurrency will also take time but uh, uh, in upcoming future uh, it will be huge uh, opportunity for everyone and all the users and the business as well great thank you so last year as we know was you know disastrous for the crypto industry uh, we all uh, saw terra luna we all saw ftx and what not uh, the good part is 
Uh, the good part is that uh, majority of the bad actors are now out of this industry. And uh, this year outlook looks very, very positive. If you look at uh, the various uh, predictions for blockchain industry as well as crypto, everyone is positive. And with Bitcoin ETF getting approved, Ethereum ETF coming up, Bitcoin halving coming up, Duncan update coming up, a lot of good things coming up. I think the future of the industry looks very, very bright. The blockchain industry, irrespective, is growing with 80%. And it will be like 600 billion, 700 billion industry by 2030. I think uh, if we nurture this Web3 culture, blockchain culture, crypto culture in India, it can become one of the key drivers in making India the third largest economy, which is the dream of our Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Josna, uh, am I audible? I think you're in mute. Yeah, I can hear everyone. Yeah, great. So this is my last I question can, yeah. to the panel. Oh, what is your prediction for the ecosystem in 2024 and five years down the line? Yeah, uh, in a short term horizon, I think we all are sitting pretty much on the inflection curve of market cycles. So I think from that, from an asset point of view, I think the next 12 months to 24 months are very positive. Uh, but I'm more hopeful of the long term view, actually, because I do think crypto does not have a geography limited aspect as such by the design of it. So the kind of Web3 coming up from India and specifically built for the growth from India. I think Web3 will be the leading industry in terms of that versus Web2. Just because it's very global in nature, most of the companies coming would very much be global in nature, built out of here. Um, second thing I feel is the shape and form it's taking with ATFs as a very recognized financial assets across the globe. I do think the kind of uh, product that will be built in terms of a financial return as a capital asset, that we will see expedite quite a lot, which has not happened before the ATF's approval until now. Uh, and the third thing to say, I think the kind of actual real use cases in terms of crypto solving for global payments, let's say, and global liquidity, I think some of those in the next five years will be really good uh, across the region. So the tech that is being built out, the kind of infrastructure that is being led out, uh, it is so quite positive on that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll open the... Quick. So, so one thing to add, I just remembered, we talked about adoption and what is going forward. Um, I'm not sure how many of us are aware, but just about a month back, ONDC with Google launched one of their largest you know, coding competitions or hackathons, as you call it. One of the problem statements there was to build a P2P distributed ledger technology, which can help farmers uh, put all of their loan transactions onto the blockchain. Right. So you see ONDC, which is one of the largest distributed infrastructure, with Google, one of the largest, again, infrastructure companies in digital space, if they're coming together, you can see the adoption is already happening. It has already started. So we are already, like, like we heard just, we are at that inflection point where this is ready to take off, right? And there are many more of such applications which will come. I was just outside the room with someone from one of the very leading uh, manufacturing companies, a very popular brand, and they were saying that internally now, they're able to produce green energy. They have internal projects which they're going to consume. And now they're thinking, what, if, what can we do if you have surplus of it, right? So this is where the technology is there. And that is a message to, you know, from enterprises and to companies that, you know, it is time, I think, right uh, now to start building those bridges. Most of the bigger companies have uh, a startup engagement cell and, and, you know, where they onboard solutions. I think that should happen and, and start to happen right as we go from 2024 and, and onwards, right? Great. Thank you so much, also. Uh, we'll open the panel for audience questions. So if you have any question from a crypto perspective, be it an investor or a potential startup founder, just, you know, they're here. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, it's a question for Rahul, sir. Uh, great discussion. So the question is, you mentioned companies accept payment in cryptocurrencies. So who are these companies who are accepting payment in cryptocurrencies? And who are the companies that, are, that, uh, that is uh, making it possible? Sure. So like if you uh, see in the global market, in the US market, there are a lot of companies like e-commerce portals who are accepting uh, crypto as a payment mode where you can purchase the goods easily with any crypto payment method. Uh, do you know like uh, any name? 
Uh, I don't remember the name, but of course, yes, there are a lot of uh, products available. Tesla is the one. Tesla, okay. Yeah, Tesla is a big brand. He's accepting the Bitcoin for purchasing the cars. Okay. Th uh, thanks for answering. Uh, I have one more question for, uh, for Mr. Patel. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, Web3 gaming companies, they don't need to register with FIU. So Web3 payment companies, they need to register? Yes. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, for that matter, Mudrex has a product called as Saber, where we do help uh, other companies, and we do enable other companies to accept Web3, to accept crypto payments, and uh, do transactions over there. So for example, we work with this product called as Fire Drops. It's a product of Flipkart. It's an NFT marketplace that they've built. Uh, and if you want to do any purchases over there, all those payments get processed by Mudrex. So, so yeah, so that's fairly Thank standard. you. Uh, and to add it, I, I know about Saber and I'm one of their consumers as well, so it really works. So 2122, my name is Rajiv. Uh, 2122 was a, was a couple of years when the world got afraid of cryptocurrencies. That's the reason why there was so much of a reaction. The quantum of you know regulation, Indian government, Chinese banning, everybody happened. What can we get right this time around as an industry to make sure that the rest of the world doesn't fear this revolution? Uh, open to everybody. So I think uh, what we need to understand is that technology is neither good nor bad. Okay, and uh, any technology if you have, it can be used for good and bad purpose. Any technology means anything. Right from car to internet to telephone to physical currency. So if it's a new industry, then somehow uh, it attracts bad players. And because the systems and processes are not in place to restrict those bad players. Okay, so uh, our job as a society is to ensure that whatever good is there, and I think there is overwhelming good in, in, in blockchain and crypto technology, uh, to make sure that that part is, uh, is encouraged and uh, the bad parts are discouraged, okay? Uh, and that's a process. It doesn't happen in one day. Uh, FIU registration, for example, by government of India, where you have to, you can, you have to report as a obligation suspicious transaction. That's, I think, one step uh, uh, in that direction. I think most of the exchanges have, Indian exchanges I know for sure, have really, really improved their processes in last two years. Uh, that uh, the chances of a fraud or a, or a wrong transaction has significantly gone down. Uh, can it become zero? I don't know. But I think it's a direction and we are moving in the, di the right direction. You, I mean, the thing is that if you, if you try to kill the right people, if you try to kill the people who are actually the, doing the business in the right way, you are actually not serving the purpose. You are actually, do, what you are doing is that you are discouraging the good good use of the technology and you're encouraging the bad because everything will go underground. See, when it comes to technology, right, uh, and also these kind of payment instruments, see, uh, usually these kinds of regulations, it tries to stop anything bad from happening, right? That's why upfront itself you want to give KYC. And if there is uh, any kind of transaction, suspicious transactions, then they just want to hear it first, etc. But before these kinds of regulations are in place, uh, people can still do something bad with it. So one thing a lot of people don't understand yet is, if you're doing something wrong, it does not matter what you used. Wrong is wrong. Okay. And if it is punishable crime, then it will be punished irrespective of whether you use crypto to do it wrong or if you use cash to do it wrong or any, any other commodity to do it wrong. So these things just gives the confidence to other people as well that when I am dealing with a particular entity or if we are doing with a particular which, which already have processes in place, uh, then probably whatever I'm trying to do is correct and it should be a smooth transaction and I can trust it, right? So this is the, 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 this, this, this pretty, pretty much transition is where we are in right now. So one step at a time. So we have something called travel rule that uh, all of the exchanges like us are supposed to implement. So where it says that along with a particular transaction in cryptocurrency that is going, 
the in some part of the information or the metadata of who is sending it is also put on the blockchain so that the on the receiver who could be in the same country or some other country is aware that okay whoever is sending is receiving this this is very similar to how in swift uh, if you have ever got in investments and such you would have noticed that you also once you get the money the go, the bank will also ask for kyc of the sender on the same swift message as well so who is sending it why they are sending it what is the relationship with the bank how long they, they have been the customer and what is the source of funds and all like some 7 to 10 questions so in this way when information about why a transaction is happening travels together with the actual money itself it its reliability will continue to improve and that's exactly what is happening in crypto space as well over a period of time i think this will this will be more and more stricter i don't think it will be uh, easier but that will become more credible also yeah right. to add to that you have to look at two things which we discuss a bit one is education and awareness which is i believe uh, very very important now if you go back a few years you saw there's a campaign which used to run mutual fund sahi hai right the, it was about simply educating people what can be done with mutual funds now given technology like we said it can be used for good or wrong today even with upi and qr code lot of scams happen and and, and you know that that widely reported across you know news and print media so my take on this is bad will happen the way we come out of it is we plan for what things can go wrong and there is enough intelligence and awareness with the financial regulators in this country to be able to anticipate what and where things can go wrong and plan for a recourse mechanism where a normal janta what you say of people of the country if something goes on they can approach call someone talk to someone or even for example like you said educating the local police and and, and the administration that if there is or the cyber cell with enough knowledge and awareness that if something goes wrong with this what is the next step they can do so i believe with awareness education and planning for the disaster scenarios is where i think what we need to do to be able to give the confidence to people that yes if you are utilizing this technology for some application for some use or even if you're buying crypto and storing it there is actually something good you can do with it right and like in the words of google you know the the message is don't be evil right so th that's what i will tell anyone who wants to be in the web3 and crypto space is just don't be evil i think that's all the time we had i'm being asked to wrap up quickly so thank you so much uh, you know all the panelists thank you so much for joining us for this dis uh, discussion